RCR with Paul Brennan, Reality Check Radio. Boy, that Friday morning rolls around pretty quick, doesn't it? I always look forward to Friday morning because it's the morning we do our political panel. And here we go again with Olivia Pearson. Hi, Olivia. Oh, good morning, Paul. Marty Gibson is back again in his, he's got an old microphone. You look like you're someone from the 30s about to make some sort of speech into an old <laughs> microphone, Marty. People could see yeah. that. It's resting on a glass of ours. So, uh, a glass it, of ours, did you say? A glass of ours. Oh, so it is. <laughs> yeah, oh, a glass of ours. <laughs> cutting edge technology. Hi, how are you doing, Paul? Yeah, good. Uh, and uh, Cam Slater, of course. Hi, Cam. Hi, Paul. How are you? Good morning. Okay. I think um, there's so many things around. They all have their own sort of gravitas. Let's start with um, a few comments that um, David Seymour's been making about the man he described on this program as the strange little man. (laughs) I thought he was talking about himself, but he wasn't. No. I think David Seymour is is in a blind panic. I I mean, I heard him on... Uh, Sean Plunkett uh, yesterday, and just losing the plot, even contemplating thinking, even ke- thinking about having to deal with Winston Peters, because of course we saw the News Hub poll released on Wednesday night, which showed that New Zealand First is just hovering under that five percent mark, and at this stage of the election campaign, you'd have you'd be a, a crazy person to bet against Winston Peters getting the five percent. And you're seeing National and Act together only being able to get a bare majority, just 61 seats. And so it makes sense that you're looking at a three-way government. And, of course, that was matched by the Roy Morgan poll uh, earlier in the week and then again by the the Taxpayers' Union Courier poll the week before. And so I think you're seeing David Seymour in a blind panic that he's not going to have this march towards a two-party government where he gets to control Christopher Luxon um, and, uh, rather than you know sharing that control over Christopher Luxon with Winston Peters, who's far too clever and far too cunning to allow Seymour to play his little hizzy fit um, types of politics. When you said when you described how he sounded with Shawnee, give us an example <clears throat> of that because I didn't hear that. Well, he's he's clearly got some talking points because it didn't matter what Sean Plunkett had asked him. He comes back to, oh, Winston betrayed us in 2017 and um, uh, all these sorts of you know nonsensical arguments that you hear mainly from National Party people who have never voted for Winston Peters. So God knows how he's supposed to have betrayed them when they never <laughs> voted for him. But he was just saying, oh, you can't trust him. You can't do this. You can't do that. He's never delivered anything. But Sean never hit him back and said, well, David, what have you ever delivered? Because what has he delivered? He's delivered nothing. He was a lone voice in Parliament for two terms. So, you know, is he really going to be able to deliver all of these things that he's got there? Or some of them just so fanciful that not even the National Party will entertain them. So, you know, I, I just think he's... It's all he's got. He can't attack the Labour Party because he's not going to get any votes from them. He can only attack National or attack New Zealand First to get votes. Could he, again, lose, could he lose votes to New Zealand First between now and the day? Well, I think he could because he's now painted himself into a corner by saying he's refusing to do any sort of coalition deal with New Zealand First. So he, what, what he's done is actually hand all the cards to Winston Peters that if national, if, if Seymour is going to stick to that, he's not going to do a deal. Then he's telling his voters, he's telling his supporters, I've got no guarantee that I can deliver anything when we, after the election, because I won't do a deal with Winston Peters. I won't go into government. Now I can tell you that Christopher Luxon will do a deal with the devil to be the prime minister, including Winston Peters. And Winston and Christopher Luxon will sit there and go, well, okay, where can where can ACT and Seymour go if they say they're not going to do that? They're not going to vote against supply for a national New Zealand first government, are they? They're mm. not going to support Labour. They're not going to support the Greens. So what's Seymour's taken all his cards off the table. I think it's just bizarre. And Olivia, voters- Marty, any thoughts? Well, my, my main thought is how much uh, unpalatable stuff was National hoping to outsource to ACT? 
you know, how, how many things that they wouldn't have campaigned on would they have, Christopher Luxon have twisted <clears throat> his metaphorical hair into pigtails and said, well, you know, coalition agreement, <laughs> you know, and, and is that um, what we're seeing uh, Seymour freak out about, that maybe they'd had a chat about that and it's just uh, upsetting his plans? Uh, so they, in that interview, Sean started off by saying he used the term likelihood that New Zealand first may be in Parliament, and David went back and forth with him on that um, because Sean denied saying that it was likely, and Seymour kept saying, look, you're making me have to comment on a hypothetical. Um, and Seymour was saying that he feels that Winston has no, no real path into um, even being a kingmaker. And so they went back and forth over whether it was likely or not. It was actually a little bit silly. But, um, yeah, I mean, Seymour seemed to be saying that a vote for Winston was a vote for Labour. Well, that's bollocks because Winston Peters has come out just this week uh, and on News Talk ZB and, and in Radio New Zealand saying there's no way he's going to support supply or do any deal or do anything with Labour. They're racists and he won't do deals with them. You know, and, and I think um, what we're seeing from David Seymour is a bit of a reaction to uh, a fundraising meeting he had this week, of which I know a couple of people who were at it. And there's, you know, uh, David Seymour has talked a big game on co-governance and talked a big game on free speech and all of that. And these donors uh, were at this meeting with David Seymour, and they put it to him about one bill in particular, the Coastal Areas Bill, where National is seen to be very squishy on that and uh, would happily sign up um, handing over our beaches and fishing areas to Maori elites. And uh, ACT was seen you know, seen by these people as perhaps a party that would, would oppose that. And they got the distinct impression from David Seymour that whilst he talks a big game in public about this, in private to them, he was shown to be very, very squishy. And they've told me there's no way they're going to give any money to act now after that meeting. And I think David Seymour's got that message and he's realised, hell, um, you know what? That's the boat that Winston's driving. That's the thing that Winston is big on. He is hostile, incredibly hostile to co-governance. He's very hostile to foreign influence in New Zealand, which the National Party, of course, announced this week that they're going to happily to take big swadges of Chinese cash, you know, back the dump truck up. Um, so Winston Peters is now taking that thunder that David Seymour has had to himself for three years and cannibalizing Axe Foden. What we're seeing is this blind panic from David Seymour. It's he wouldn't have made, describe it. He wouldn't have made that comment about Labour, vote for Winston as vote for Labour after what Winston said if he wasn't feeling like he was in a corner. Yeah. Well, it's right. all over Twitter, I've noticed. Um, just the average New Zealander is yeah, that's toy weighing up whether to vote for ACT or whether to vote for New Zealand first. Um, that's a very common thread coming through is um, that if they vote for Winston, they'll end up getting Labour again. Um, I'm not sure how they make that equation other than that they think that Vincent, uh, Vincent, Winston might lie and change his mind. Um, but I think that Winston's been, as Cam was saying, super clear that he will not go with Labour, and I, I actually do believe him on that. that. That's a legacy of Winston derangement syndrome from the media for about the last 10 years, I would say. That's yeah, it. I think you're right. All right. Well, that's uh, that's interesting. Let's see um, how that one goes. We'll get back maybe to talking about Chinese funding roads shortly, but there's a huge, probably the biggest political story on the planet right now, and that is uh, Devin Archer's testimony. And he's just been on, I see, with um, with uh, Tucker Carlson too, and there's more to come on that. He's a he's a suave-looking guy. and um, But what he's been saying so far is, I would say, sensational, Olivia, sensational. Well, uh, look, I mean, the House Oversight Committee member, Daniel Goldman, you know, the guy from New York um, who's been pushing this, uh, said on Monday to CNN, to Anderson Cooper, that the House Republicans' investigation into Joe Biden and Hunter Biden needed to end now because it was badgering a private citizen. 
um, I mean, I just found that after what we've seen them do to Trump for all this time, if you've ever seen badgering of a private citizen, it's been what they've done to Trump. But Goldman, you know, he said, it's true. It's truly stunning to me. This is a taxpayer-funded defence and political arm of Donald Trump. Um, Devin Archer's testimony confirms that Joe Biden lied to the American people when he said he had no knowledge about his Multiple son's business. times. Oh, so many times we've all lost count. Um, when he said his son's business dealings, uh, that he was not involved in them. And Joe Biden was the brand that his son sold around the world to enrich the Biden family. The Biden um, crime family. The crime family. After also um, Archer's testimony about Shokin, remember the... Um, Burisma. The prosecutor, yep. Oh, yes, the, the the prosecutor looking into the Burisma dealings um, confirms that the Republican version of events explo- explaining Joe Biden's big boast in 2018 that, you know, remember that. Son of on, a bitch. Yeah, son of a bitch and that he had Shokin fired. Um, Democrats have always tried to argue, uh, especially during the 19. 19- uh, 2019 impeachment investigation of Trump, that Shokin was himself corrupt and that his firing was um, the position of the US government um, and basically the whole entire global community as well. But no, um, after the testimony, it shows you that Trump's version of events, that because of Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution, um, that turns out to have been correct all the time. So Yep, it was a, an amazing testimony. By threatening to withhold a billion dollars of aid. Of aid. But 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 worse than that, Olivia, um, he confirmed that they were paid, paid to do that. Yeah, paid that to was play. A, they were paid to play, to uh-huh. get Joe Biden. They were paid by Burisma to get Joe Biden to sack Shokin. Yep. Absolutely, they were. Um, but I mean, the whole the, it's been bribery all the way along. And that was always clear to me because they uh, because of what they leveled at Trump. You know, we, we know this, that, you know, whatever the Dems accuse the Trump of doing, they've done themselves mm-hmm. going all the way back to Hillary, giving them the Uranium One deal with Russia. I mean, if anybody's colluded with Russia, it's been the Democrats yeah. very deeply. Incredible. Yeah. Um, but yeah, good that Devin Archer has made this testimony um, necessary. And, of course, they tried so hard to stop him, didn't they, by starting his prison sentence last Saturday. Um, The Democrats didn't want him to make that testimony, so you knew it would be bad. Um, So, yeah, it is the biggest story in the world because it confirms the the corruption. I don't think anyone's surprised. I'm certainly not surprised. Is, Is anyone on this panel surprised at Devin Archer's testimony? Well, not at all. And and with the Ukraine war going on, you have to wonder if Biden, if if there's something that that is in the machinations of the Biden crime family is is propelling that war because it could have ended, right? It could have ended. And um, remember, we're supporting that war. We're supporting it. We've put money into it. So, I mean, there's all these questions up in the air. And just remember, three hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand Ukrainian men, and that's not the civilians apparently dead so far. So this is this is horrible, potentially horrible. I mean, God knows what's going on in the Ukraine. There are some very, very toe-curling stories that I've seen and heard. Um, it's just hard to get verification of what's true and what's propaganda. But, um, you know, there are Russian soldiers coming out saying that they've found, you know, warehouses full of children. Yeah, child child so trafficking you- and ha- organ harvesting. So is, is the leader of the free world involved in this? We, we've got to ask that question. I don't, well, I don't think you can call him a leader. Okay, well, you know, the metaphorical. D- the bewildered, D- dementia the be- in chief. <laughs> Diaper wearer, yeah. 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 Mr. Um, Prinkle Pants. Well, <laughs> look, I mean, from, you know, if um, Sound of Freedom is anything to go by, this is happening all over the world. It's happening in America and the politicians and very high up people have everything to do with it. Ukraine has the highest surrogacy level the the largest surrogacy business in the world wow just saying surrogacy as in rent a uh, womb rent a womb right yeah. sorry marty you're going to say something oh just um the thing that bothers me most about it is the coverage of of the whole thing in new zealand really 
disturbs me that that we kind of meant to believe that uh, Biden is a as a the functional U.S. president, and we don't hear anything about Hunter. We don't hear anything about Merrick Garland and the DOJ's very, very quiet treatment of this because of the extent of the cover-up. Um, and, you know, the, then you've got the Republicans who, uh, you know, are holding off on talking impeachment because they're worried it's going to cost them the House. You know, yeah. even even as the DOJ is being weaponized against the most likely... Um, uh, candidate for, for president for from the Republicans. So Yeah, it's an extraordinary lack of courage and honesty, isn't it? I mean, Biden's dementia was very clear during the uh, 2020 election and all those debates leading up to it. It was so obvious. And remember how Chris Wallace had to play nursemaid in that debate? That was I mean, embarrassing. And he, and he ended up debating Trump himself from the mediator chair. Um, it was absolutely. It, it could be that the Republicans are trying to pace this out to to nullify the effects of of Trump and sort of time out an impeachment with what rolls out with Trump. So we don't know. But are they, but are, they yeah. are they mental? I mean, honestly, you know, um, they've got all of these things um, that they're pr- persecuting Trump with, and Trump must be sitting there rubbing his hands with glee because next year's election year. And he's going to be front and centre and leading every single news item for months on end with these multiple cases that are out there. Yeah, they start and, so, so they start the trials start in March and they're staggered yeah. all the way through the year, aren't they? So all the way through the year, Trump's going to be news and it's going to be Trump, 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 Trump. The name recognition is going to be through the roof. And the longer it goes on and the lack of evidence that's shown, it's going to only help Trump. And the Democrats think somehow, like, honestly, I think Trump right now would have to be caught hanging out the back of a goat um, for him to take any hit in his polls because <laughs> this sort of stuff just, re- just reinforces, um, you know, the, the belief that the Democrats are unhinged and that this is nothing but per- political persecution. And then pe- people generally like a fair go. And then what they're seeing is that's not a fair go. This isn't a fair go that that Trump's getting on this, and they'll vote for him on that basis. And that's the if they can vote for him because timings are everything. If he is found by a jury to be guilty on any of those indictments, he can't run. The Supreme Court might decide or overturn them later on, but in the meantime, they've snookered him from running. I just well, think it's so obvious that this is a hit job on Trump and always has been. So many Democrats have woken up to that. Who said, who came out the, uh, Oliver Stone came out the other day and said that he regretted voting for Biden in 2020. I saw that, yeah. Mm. I mean, biggest lefty in the world. And didn't we have Moore. Blinken and the husband of Kamala Harris in the country this week speaking to your point, Marty? No one asked them about this at all. Well, we're still talking about the Democrats, you know. We've got to be talking about the military-industrial complex. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, the, the Republicans are the military-industrial but, but he had a news conference. There were journalists there. They could have uh, thrown in a question to Blinken. Uh, I didn't see that. But, but you know, if you're still thinking um, Democrat versus Republican, you're still, you know, you've got those partisan blinkers on still. Yeah. But, uh yeah, yeah, no, it's military. military industrial complex controls the media as well. So, you know, the the danger is, what's it going to do as people as it stops working and people start, you know, rather like I guess they're doing with New Zealand First, you could argue, uh, and they're they're going against the programming. You know, is, are we going to see the next thing unleashed? Oh. Well, I mean, you know, in this in this latest iteration of a Trump indictment, um, Democrats are trying so hard to crucify Trump for the egregious sin in their minds of trying to hold a line on investigating and calling out their own ubiquitous uh, and obvious and in your face wrongdoing in the 2020 election. Um, it's exactly the same modus operandi as the original Trump impeachment, where Trump was decried in the most Um, hateful manner on every single media orifice in the world for trying to investigate and bring to light Biden's wrongdoing in the Ukraine. Um, It's become such a clear pattern. uh, And to use that good phrase, it's squid ink, squirted out as a camouflage so Democrats can hide, hide, deny and obfuscate 
Um, and the, of course, Democrats have a nice big fat euphemism for that, and it's called plausible deniability. Um, yeah, so what are they hiding? Well, I mean... Because he's all about draining the swamp and, and stuff, so there's obviously a fear that if Trump gets in, the game's up. Uh, Trump's attorney's been going around on all the different channels. He was on CNN the other day, and he was saying the one thing I will say, in 2020, Mr. Trump's campaign had a very difficult time presenting evidence. I mean, no kidding, we watched that. Um, and, he, and he went on and said, but we now have the ability to issue our own subpoenas. Um, we will relitigate every single issue of the 2020 election in the context of this litigation because it gives President Trump an opportunity that he has never had before, which is to have subpoena power. And, of course, that's because they now have the Congress, the House. Of course. But, I mean, you, you're just seeing you know, total idiocy. You know, the, the prosecutor who's filed these charges against um, Trump for January the 6th is saying this is a, an appalling attack on uh, on the nation's capital. It's unprecedented. Um, it's never happened before. Well, that's bollocks. Because in, 18, um, in 1814, British forces invaded and occupied uh, Washington, D.C. after defeating an American force at Bladensburg. Um, mm. they, they bombed the Capitol and the Treasury Building. Wow. Right? So it's not unprecedented. It was, it was known as the burning of Washington. It, it buildings was, This is what the British did, and then because of the firestorm that they created, they actually had to abandon the city after 24 hours. Now, that is, was a war. That was the British. Remember, they declared independence in 1776. Yes, that's but, quite a while afterwards. Right? So it? this is 40 years later, mm. right? That the British invaded, you know, in the War of 1812, occupied Washington D.C. and burnt it to the ground, and now these clowns and the Democrats and this Democrat prosecutor are coming out, you know, saying that that the the insurrection of January 6 was the worst thing we've ever seen. It's bollocks, and it was bollocks then, and it's bollocks now. Well, the L.A. riots were worse than that. Yeah, weren't they? I mean, much worse. January the sixth, and we we've been. That this. wasn't an insurrection. Oh, was There's right. no way that can ever be. It was be a bunch said of angry it. people saying, "Down with this sort of thing." Yeah, and, and um, with and the FBI leading yeah. the way. Yeah, it was ginned up. Yeah, it totally ginned up. It was actually um, it, the insurrection was um, from FBI plants. Yeah, yeah, yeah Ray totally. Epps. But if American Democrats seriously try, seriously do try President Trump as uh, you know former President Trump, but, um, you know, on a First Amendment issue, as this last indictment actually is, they will lose. So bring it on. I say bring it on. The whole yeah, but Western they might lose, but they might stop him from his... They might. his they might you know they're going running. to try. You know they will, will definitely try. But I, you know, again, you know, God bless the man for having the heart to do the do this again. And I don't think they'll get away with it this time. And the whole Western world needs to see America um, brandish this profound principle, the First Amendment, into the current culture so that it can be underscored once more with the importance it deserves because that, that, that principle came from America. Um, well, it was originally a British principle, but it was um, really got set in stone in America in federal law and went into every democracy, including our own, um, from there. And we all need to see um, the First Amendment become inviolate again. Anyone have anything more to say on this? Well, it didn't stop uh, the feds colluding with uh, Facebook and Twitter and, and no. uh, you know, getting around the First Amendment. The Facebook so, files is really interesting, yeah, isn't it? Now it all needs uh, strengthening up. And it's just whether the, that many billion dollars a vested interest is going to allow it to happen. You must have seen in the last, even the month, last month, I've noticed how hard it is to research anything, uh, you know, to find a, a, um, a contrary view on an orthodoxy. It, it, you know, news guards just, I, I think, really kicked in in New Zealand because if you, if you search up anything, you just get a whole lot of government agencies. It, well, it's okay. really hard to find contrarian views. So you've noticed a difference, a yeah, change. I, just, I have. Just I don't know whether you guys have, but in the last few months, um, I've noticed it's just pages of of official UN government department 
stuff. Is that on regular um, search engines or climate, on climate change? If I'm looking up anything on climate change, it, it's really difficult to get something that is against the orthodoxy. Well, you know, that's the next one, right? <laughs> that's how oh, you know. That's, I mean, they're all linked. What's the yeah. solution to climate change? We print billions of dollars and give it to countries like Ukraine. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Fascinating. And, uh, I'm sure You're we'll be talking about that on. some more. Okay, what do we talk about next? Um, on my list, I've got, uh, and we just touched on it before, National would absolutely take money from China to pay for roads. It's just the Belt and Roads of course. thing. I can't believe that Christopher Luxon said that quiet bit out loud. I just can't believe it. Like, he was asked a question, and he didn't just say, oh, yeah, sure, we'll look at um, you know, taking money from anywhere. He was specifically asked about Chinese money, and we all know that Chinese money is CCP money, which means that it comes with uh, hooks and uh, you know clauses and all sorts of fish hooks in it everywhere. And he he didn't just say, "Oh no, we'll you know we'll have to be careful." He said, "Absolutely, absolutely, we'll accept Chinese money." And of course, the National Party's been accepting Chinese money for a long time. They've still got all the money from the Chinese donors. They never paid it back. They never gave it back. They've still got it in their accounts, despite a, a court case um, finding those people guilty. All right. So National is a lock for the CCP. And it goes back to John Key's time when he was crawling, um, crawling up with um, Z, you know, trying to be there the whole time. Uh, you know, and since he's left Parliament, he's been always shilling Chinese interests in the Herald and various other places. It's all because he wants a board position on a big Chinese bank. And he's the guy that's behind Christopher Luxon. And so this is a John Key push to continue the CCP influence of the National Party and the inroads that that money brings the Chinese into our government. And I think it should be opposed. Well, the glib way that Christina Luxon, as Lindsay calls him, <laughs> smiled and talked about letting communist China loan us this money and manpower, because that's what that means too, mm. to fix our roads because we can either afford it um, and we couldn't get the workers to do it anyway. No one wants to get out of bed anymore. Um, that's not a good place for a country like ours to be. And all this after Wuhan, all this, mm. after everything that's happened coming out of China with absolutely no um, comeback. Um, the, only, the only thing global hegemonists like China love more than debt are small countries rich in resources and agriculture without strong standing armies, navies and air forces. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Sounds like us. I mean, you know, Luxon's just, I think he's, he's either stupid or naive. If he had, he, if he came, if he had any brains, he'd be a halfwit. Uh, you know, <laughs> If brains were if brains were dynamite, he wouldn't have enough to blow his nose on this issue. You know, the thing is, he says that says you know glib things like, "Oh, and whether you're on an EV or whether you're on a hydrogen truck." I mean, who talks about being on on a vehicle? On it's bizarre. Oh, you, we, <laughs> hop on you, the car. You're gonna need very good and resilient roads. Well, if that's the case, um, Chris, Christopher, mate. It ain't, Chinese, it ain't Chinese roads. Just ask everywhere else around the world that's had Chinese build their roads and, and find out just how appalling they are. You don't have to go very far. A short flight to Fiji, go have a look at the roads the Chinese built. They're, they're just crap. And, <laughs> and he's got this naive, you know, Pollyannish view that if we just trade with these tyrants, that they'll become better tyrants. Surely someone should have, like, helped him read the room. Well, he, he actually agreed when they said through the Belt and Road Initiative. Yep. Uh, I mean, I spoke to a Chinese businessman when I was in Australia, and he was talking about going from, I think, Shanghai to Beijing on the train at 300 kilometers an hour. You know, so, so what the Chinese are doing what the Russians are doing is is getting into that gap that's left by this I mean the Chinese word is baijiu which is you know all the all the ladies with purple hair are begging for Muslim refugees to come into their countries you know they just can't understand it but you know I mean if you look at uh, there was a world uh, world bank um, 
assessment of the Belt and Road Initiative, which said it's going to reduce travel times by 12%, increase trade by you know around 9%, increase income 3%, and lift 7 million people from extreme poverty. So they're stepping into that madness of reducing carbon that the West's been infected by. Um, and, and, you know, for all that the Chinese and Russians are evil on some level, uh, they're not, you know, they're not totally evil in the same way as the Americans aren't totally good. Um, well, you know, the, the climate change stuff, you can't tell me that China and Russia aren't actually funding these green lunatics to do this, to nobble Western economies so that they can come along and say, oh, here you go, have a nice bit of our little helping hand, spur it in the spirit of cooperation, here, have some money. Yeah, you know? I've, I've got uh, horrible visions of Chinese LAVs touring the country, you know, with a carrier group off the coast. <laughs> I think it'll happen. Well, yeah, if the Chinese can't project power yet, yet. And they mm. don't have don't a have carrier a group. Can't I think far off. Well, if, if New Zealand, if NATO keep pushing like they did with Putin, because they are pushing China all the time and trying to vilify them at the moment. I mean, it's not that they're good. I know that they're communists and stuff, but um, it wouldn't surprise me at all if NATO are capable of goading China into a war. NATO don't have any ammo, though, so what the hell are they doing? Unless they've got the extraterrestrial technology that everyone's (laughs) been talking about and we Mm. just don't realise it. Mm, That's been interesting. Laser beams. Well, anti-gravity. Though Italy has left the Belt and Road. They did that last week. Well, yeah. and I mean, Scott Morrison. Good on them. Yeah, at a fed- federal level, Scott Morrison didn't approve of anything being signed for the Belt and Road Initiative. But what's his name? Old um, Dictator Dan. He's into in, it. In Victoria, yeah. I mean, he made all these deals left, right and centre with China and the Belt and Road Initiative, just like he's done behind the scenes we with should- the Aborigines. We shouldn't be surprised the Italians quickly march backwards out of the Belt and Road. They are the silver medal winners of marching backwards. With the French. <laughs> the um, French are the gold, gold, yeah, the gold medal. The Argentinians are bronze. Here's a question. Apart from potholes, are our roads really that bad? Yeah. Are they? Yes, they are. Yep. They're, they they're are. rubbish. Like, I've okay, in, in, in what way? I've a truck around with a uh, hot mix in the back fixing them. And, yeah, I mean, the geology of New Zealand doesn't help. The, the new... Um, the new bitumen's crap, you know, the important yeah. bitumen's crap. The 55 crap. ton limit for trucks. We, we used we to make it at the at the refinery, right? We used yeah. to. Yeah. So they've, what they've done is imported this new green bitumen, and it's it's just not working, you know. For lightweights. Green, <laughs> green bitumen. Yeah, yeah, supposedly a lower carbon footprint. It was all ordered by, by um, uh, Megan Woods, the salad dodger. <laughs> the pie eater. Um, now, was it National that was talking about a $29 billion transport spend, or am I imagining that? Is that what they were talking about? Yeah. yeah. I, I thought New Zealand was broke. How can we but, afford that? But, well, they're, they're going to borrow it off the Chinese. No, it's China, yeah, right? By, by yeah. swapping dairy products. From uh, China. With, with Ch- Chinese. Uh, like we did butter for ladders back in the yeah, 80s. Yeah. Butter for ladders and Skodas. Remember that? They're Skodas. I used to have to drive past the larder where they put all the larders when they came into the country. There were hundreds and hundreds of larders. Yeah, they're, they're not well, attractive vehicles. I don't think they? many have stayed on the road long. Put it that way. It was a poor facsimile for a Fiat, and even those were bad. Yeah, they they bought the tooling, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, so that's that. And uh, let's stay local. And I'll just bring up my little thing again because I've just uh, bailed out of it for some reason. Okay, what's this about Chloe Swarbrick um, saying that Labour are playing politics with ram raid crackdown not based on evidence? Well, we see it in the news all the time. That's evidence. Well, that's right. And It's just the hypocrisy. This is the thing with Green Party people. They cover themselves with a shield of sanctimony and have a cloak of hypocrisy that allows them to say bizarre and crazy things uh, that any sensible person can drive a truck through their argument. So Chloe Swarbrick comes out and she says the Labour Party's uh, cracking down on ram raids. There's no evidence that this is going to um, work. You know, she says um, it's gutting that she will see that 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 they're doing this. Um, and she says um, uh, just there's you know she looks forward to seeing 
uh, evidence-based policies and that these are non-evidence-based policies and they don't work. And of course, she's a, a grand proponent of emptying the prisons. She actually wants prisons abolished. Uh, and we're seeing this rise in, in street crime uh, because the Labour Party, with their pals and the Greens, have emptied the prisons, reduced the prison population by 37%. It should be no surprise, but it just astonishes me that these fools talk about evidence-based policy. when well, got... What is the proposal to deal with it? Well, the proposal to deal with it from Labour is ambulance at the bottom of the hit, at the cliff sort of stuff, right? Well, we're going to increase penalties. Penalties mean nothing to these people. Yeah, they're criminals, penalties. right? Yeah. Um, they're, they're talking about emptying the prisons, and at the same time we're talking about increasing the – it just doesn't work. So what gets me is that the Green Party talks about evidence-based policies. Well, if they're going to talk about evidence-based policies, well, when are they going to admit – that their opposition to genetic engineering and genetic modification after 35 years is more than enough evidence to see that it's okay. When are they going to admit that we should have nuclear power stations in New Zealand? Because that's the most efficient power, um, the, the lowest greenhouse gases of any power um, generation, but they're opposed to that. I'm for so, that. So if they're going to, um, this is where the, the other media just frustrate me. They say, oh, that's great. You're wanting to have evidence-based um, uh, solutions. You know, why didn't they say to her, well, actually, we've got strong evidence from your own electorate, Chloe, that soft sentencing instead of prison for an assault perpetrator who strangled his partner, right, let out, given five months, uh, no, not even in prison, five months on home detention, there's evidence right there that soft sentencing doesn't work because he went out and shot two people in, mm. his, in her electorate. Did she have her eyes and ears closed when they? Mind happened? you, you just said that you know harsher sentences are not going to make much difference. So she might have a point in a way. Well, no, that she's saying that there's no evidence that harsher sentences stop criminals committing crime when they get out, and that's probably true. Right. But here's the thing: if they're in prison, they're not on the streets committing crime while they're in prison. Yeah, yeah that, right. and that's the point of prison, isn't it? It's that yeah. these people can't. Um, live without harming people, therefore we put them away. Yeah. Like yeah if, the risk if, of getting caught is is a, a major deterrent. <laughs> yeah. Well, well we've got a catch and release policy anyway. But, you know, that guy who strangled his partner and got five months home D, if he had been put in prison, two people would still be going to work today. Yeah, and two, two, two mm -hmm. sets of families would have their fathers, you know. Yeah, and, and, on the, and on the flip side of that, We've got the judiciary that are jailing people for speaking freely in the streets or putting up a target at a rifle range, yeah. jailing them, but people who actually commit harm, physical harm on people, are getting home detention. If you look at, at the evidence they talk about, I remember back in early June, there was a a drive on that, you know, prisons don't work thing. And I did a bit of a dive into one of the guys who was quoted. It was Dr. John Buttle. He was a senior lecturer at AOT, AUT School of Social Sciences and Policy. A wombo. And you read his stuff, and I don't know if you've read much um, neo-Marxist academic stuff, but it's just so fluffy. You know, you get assertions and you look for a, a, a reference and there's none. You look for numbers and there's none. And I remember one of the sentences. Um, That's why you don't read it, Marty. Well, you got to because, uh, you know, what they're doing is based on it. I, 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 he basically said, oh, they don't work, they'll never work, they do not deter, they do not rehabilitate. Given this, prison abolition is the only sane policy response because it's the only thing that has not been tried. <laughs> so that's the sort of level of logic you, you, you're dealing with as evidence. Until Somebody's... someone comes to, to his door, smashes it down, yeah. and, and robs, beats him up and robs everything in the house. It's well, like as, the, as Theodore Dalrymple uh, said, it's a common misconception among liberals that if there were more justice in the world, there'd be fewer people in jail. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. All right. Do we have anything more to say about that? Let's get on to well, the. she's another one. Chloe, she's <laughs> another one. If she, if she had any brains, she'd be a half-wit. Yeah. Okay. All right. New data shows that the percentage of school leavers attending or attaining NCEA Level 2 has consistently fallen under Labour. Just 59% of Māori students attained Level 2 2022, a 10% drop since 20, 
17. Yeah. Going backwards. I mean, is, it's damning. And, and I guess the reason I'm so keen to talk to these kind of stats at any um, opportunity is because I get so sick of talking about gangs and crime. It all comes from this. And you've got to really start uh, start asking the question, well, where are the Maori leaders on this? You know, you've got this graph showing Maori school leavers. Um, you know, they've gone from about maybe 69% of them getting NCEA level two, which is ginned up anyway, so it looks much better than it is. Going from 69% uh, around 2017, and now it's kind of around 58%. Uh, and and the flow on effects that that has in people's lives uh, is is appalling. You know, if you get so, mm. some kid who spends ten years in these union approved um, schooling systems and can't uh, read, they and, just know, got fourteen and a half percent pay rise too. By the way, but yeah, yeah but this for, is the for sort what? of stuff. This is the sort of stuff that Alan Duff was talking about when he brought out Ones for Warriors. It's the sort of stuff that. Uh, that yesterday uh, on my show, uh, Brian Tamaki was talking about that we we no one is actually prepared to say we have a Maori problem in crime statistics and all of those, which also stems from what Alan Duff was saying in that we've got a Maori problem in education as well, and no one's actually saying we've got a a boy problem in education and a man problem in crime as a result of the lack of education, the lack of opportunities that then derive from being stupid and having no qualifications. And because the vast majority of violent criminals are stupid. I, I don't know if you've ever spoken to any reasonable yeah. sized groups of, of uh, hardened criminals. You know, and I've, I've spoken to a couple of guys at, at the church, you know, um, with the Grace Foundation, one guy had, you know, killed a couple of people. His tattoos showed the story of his of his time in jail. And he said to me, you're not afraid of me. And I said, well, you're just a bloke. You know, I'm having a chat. He goes, but I've killed people. And I went, well, that was stupid. And we carried on talking. And nobody, when you actually talk to these guys, they really are dumb. And, yeah. and that's a fault of their parenting. It's a fault of their upbringing. It's a fault of the education system. And it's a failure in the justice system as well. Interesting and how school, the only school that seems to be really have that those issues nailed down is um, St Paul's. St. Paul's well, in charter Col schools before they were abolished on the first day that Labor took power. Yeah, but St St Paul's and just up the road in Ponsonby, um, he they, they they've got a I think a ninety percent UE rate. It's all Samoans and Maoris. Mm. Um, they they have re they got a new headmaster a few years ago and he really turned that school around, um, which shows you that it's it can be done um, and discipline is a huge factor there, but also a real real focus on academia. Are they doing the rainbow stuff? No, I they, doubt don't, it. they oh, don't do the rain rainbow stuff. I mean, they're a Catholic school that just seem to guess what? They just want to educate their kids. Yeah, the, the child, How weird is child that? centered in the true way rather than allowing children to, to be trans. But, you know, Thomas Sowell, you know, the mm. American, yeah. black American uh, academic from Harlem, um, wrote that book in, I think, 2020, uh, Charter Schools and Their Enemies. And, you know, it's the examples he had in that, he had one, you know, they put them in the same building often. And in one, you've got the public school students where 7% of them passed the maths test, while down the hall in the charter school, 100% passed the test. Yeah. You, you know, these they, are the same kids. And, and the unions don't want charter the schools. The unions block they, it. They don't want it because it shows them up. It and the Maori leaders actually benefit from the tutua being dumb. You know, as the proverb goes, the converse, uh, the food of chiefs is conversation. The food of uh, commoners is uh, inattention. Um, the, it suits them just fine to have these kids crashing out of the acad academic system and thinking that all their problems come from park hours. And, and that drives, you know, why not ram rate a shop? Yeah. Well, you can also trade off that, can't you? That's what With endless do. programs that... Yeah. You can clip a ticket on millions um, and millions of dollars of programs that we've. You look at the the last six years alone. How many millions of dollars in that have been set aside for for Maori programs to help them with this and help them with health and help them. 
if you look at it over decades, over 30 years, it's billions and billions of dollars that have been poured into these, what they call vulnerable areas, right? I saw a statistic um, yesterday, uh, something like 90% of funerals in on you know around Gisborne in, in that area are paid for by the state through WINS grants. 90%. The average in the whole country is 10%. So we've got vast areas of New Zealand, Northland in particular, the east coast of the North Island uh, as well, that are impoverished. And we've poured billions of dollars into these programs. Who gets and, the money? Well, a, that's a, the, self, a selected group of uh, in crowds. And I was looking at uh, Manaki Tarafiti, which is, you know, uh, a program that was held up by the Productivity Commission as being exemplary. It's the same old faces, you know, the same old people who keep it bumping along in last place and, and, and you know, always hold themselves up as being the spigot through which all public funding must flow, and they just don't deliver. Well, also, there's a, there's a, there is an absolutely massive cult- cultural component to all this ram raiding and... Um, negativity amongst youth and crime and I mean they you know they 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 idolize gang members and they idolize gangster culture from the states and films filled with filled with violence and computer games and playstations and all that sort of stuff and I mean if they think it's cool and badass you know to to commit crimes that's what they're going to do they they need better heroes well it's not their parents that's the problem that's what Brian Tamaki was saying to me just yesterday on my show you know, that, that, that we are not creating parental role models and these kids are, aren't going to school. The statistics show that. And their role models are gang members. And yeah. why are we surprised that we've got a problem with youth crime in New Zealand? Because the only role models they've got are, 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 are criminals. And the victimology. That, yeah. you know, and then I, then it's, out. Yeah, it's colonialism's fault, you know. Mm. Well, and, and that other incentive uh, pressure that governments love anything that makes people demand less freedom and more government. Gangs fit that bill. Fatherless kids fit that bill. Prisons that don't reform fit that but, bill. But you see that seeping in because there was a news item on Wednesday night about how at, at one of the, uh, you know, World Cup soccer games that, Eden Park, that, it, that the fire alarm had got off. And then there's some woke sort of wet liberal hand-wringing bloke standing there going, but there was nobody to tell us what to do. Yeah, he, yeah. He, he literally was saying that. that mm. There was no one to do. Mate, did you see any smoke? Right, <laughs> That's where the fire is. Yeah. Right? When the fire alarm goes off, you look around. Where am I not going to head? I'm not going to head towards the smoke. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on the field. I'm going to exit this as... But no I wonder so many people did what they're told by the government. He, he wanted yeah. to be told what to do by someone, presumably wearing a day a day glow vest of some <laughs> with a know, road some clipboard wearing, you know, jobs worth to tell him what to do because there's a fire alarm. What? We never knew those people existed uh, prior to COVID, COVID, did we? We we always assumed, you know, there are some people who who like people telling them what to do. Uh, you know, who, who like telling people what to do. And there are some people who hate people telling them what to do. We didn't re- realize there was this huge group, big group of people who like being told what to do. Mm, I know who would have loved it. It, it well, reminds me, yeah. my, reminds me of Mark Stein's comment um, around that time where he said, you know, we we've dumbed ourselves down beyond our capacity to survive. Yeah. That's um, well put. You know, and and I think that that's you see that everywhere from being having the need to be told what to do. Um, I mean, use your own brain for goodness sakes. Why God gave you one, make your own calls. But the trouble and, is, though, and, Olivia, and it's like it's like losing your own humanity. But the trouble is, um, Olivia, that when God was giving out the the brains, most of these people thought that He said trains, and they all asked for a slow one. <laughs> Um, on the ram raids, surely, and I can see why they did it, but putting tobacco up ridiculously high price has been driving a lot of this. It's more expensive than dope. So why? Well, how dumb was that? 
It's incredibly dumb. I mean, who but cares again, if a bit, few extra people smoke? But it's predictable. It, it has happened everywhere in the world. Bhutan is a classic case. They ramped up taxes on tobacco in Bhutan, and the black market surged, crime surged, all sorts of things. And they went, why did that happen? Well, because I mean, you, it's you made so it worthwhile, to me. you know? So lower the price of tobacco. Yeah. It's good. It and give it of... free to the homeless because all I see them doing is going through rubbish bins. It's very demeaning. Go and yeah. hand it out to them. Well, yeah. I, I've always said to Winston privately, you know, that you got it wrong with the gold car, Winston. <clears throat> Instead of giving it to pensioners, you should have given a gold card to smokers because mm-hmm. they've paid billions and billions of dollars in extra tax in their lifetime, and then they peg out before they get to get any benefits from it. So they should actually have the gold card now. <laughs> From 30 and, onwards. Yeah. And the other thing, getting back to NCEA, um, Marty, you know, and I mentioned that the teachers have had quite a whopping pay increase. Uh, I wonder what the panel thinks. Is that a payoff of course to teachers is. to vote oh. for Labour this it, election? Of course. The most is. numerous uh, uh, union occupation in, in Parliament is ex teacher, followed by ex union organiser. So, if you ever wondered what a country run by teachers and unionists was like, here we are. We well, you it. know, they say a, a, a king heads up a kingdom, a prince heads up a principality, and New Zealand's a country. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think I get that. Uh, okay, I, last subject. Uh, secret Aboriginal land rights deal set to give Indigenous groups sweeping powers over 10 Victorian... Oh, Victoria again. Here we go. Oh, Councils well, I mean, spanning half the size... Of Tasmania, the continent of Tasmania, as Les Patterson used to say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, the I triangular shaped from, continent. I haven't come from Australia. I, I did have a chat with some uh, of my Aussie mates about this, and I was saying, mate, you're getting played. You know, it's that old thing, you know, that the Aboriginal people or Indigenous people generally are just a, a lever for people who want to disenfranchise citizens from their own countries you're not legitimately here right you're a colonizer you don't belong here so it just takes the fight out of them and i was sort of saying that to them and that it wouldn't result in better outcomes for aborigines and they just had that too tired to fight thing you know just like oh you know they probably should get something i used to work for uh at warringah council when i lived in sydney for a bit just when i first got there and the council had been sacked and i had to go around offices and, oh, you know, I think the mayor's office was vacant. It had a huge liquor cabinet. And so I used to have a couple of Bloody Marys in the morning. And I used to go out and raise the flag. And um, and I'd have a bit of a glow on and there'd be a passing Aussie. And I'd say, oh, excuse me, we're a bit short-staffed. Um, it's regulations that you have to salute while I'm raising the flag. So I'd raise the flag. and then They'd do it. Citizen, they're saluting me. Okay. And then I'd have to raise the Aboriginal flag. And I, I'd say, and while I'm raising this one, if you can just bow down and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, th- this is, it, it's, it's similar to what's happening in New Zealand. I mean, you look at ABC did a fact check on it because some conservative think tank said, um, that, uh, you know, that they could look at New Zealand and see, you know, what was going to happen. And, you know, then it said the ABC fact check has said, but that's not how the experts see it with Richard Boast, a law professor at Wellington's Victoria University, labelling the statement as absurd and completely unfounded. Now, he's a he's a treaty lawyer. It comes from the, well, he would say that. Of course, um, of course, yeah. You know, and then he quoted some other lady, Claire Charters, a law professor with Auckland University, who's told Checkmate it was incorrect and it doesn't make sense. She's a, she's a treaty lawyer. She's worked on UNDRIP. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's exactly the same thing as what's happened here. It's giving the Indigenous people the the, the rights over our water, their water in Australia, um, their rates, what they can do on their land. Um, you know, if they want to move a little patch of soil from there yeah, to 20 there kilos. or dig, yeah, 20 kilos. I mean, that's nothing, is it? Yeah, it's a post hole. The, the person who's been vocifer- vociferously outraged is, again, Gina Reinhardt. Um, over the Isn't mining- she splendid? I think she's wonderful. <laughs> she's I just really, splendid, um, you know. Yeah, but but it's not for the indigenous people, is it? It's for no, uh, no, it's not. They're the last people on the list. Yeah, 
Too. Well, women thought women thought the Rockefellers and the CIA were doing them a big favor sponsoring feminism, but what they were sponsoring was division and demoralization of their most likely opponents. And it's the same with all this indigenous stuff. Division and demoralization. Oh well, uh, the, 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 all the, part of the plan, eh? It's, it is all exactly part of the anti-colonialist push, which is so ridiculous because we don't really have colonialism anymore. What have I mean, the British have... ever done for us? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, and I mean, they. I'm sick of it. They can criticise all they like, um, but will they ever provide anything as good as what we have hitherto known so far? They won't. It's just decline. They're just manufacturing decline. Well, we all live on the planet, and that's where it ends. Well, we're seeing that yeah. now, though. Like, you know, we used to have child, youth, and family, and then it got renamed to Oranga Tamariki because, you know, we if we give something a Maori name, it's going to be better. That That's that's what this government is. It's also $150,000 for rebranding for, for someone. So. And, well, I'm sure it was more than $150,000. Well, that's just 000. the one one person, yeah. Yeah. So they do this, right? And then we, and we get everything renamed. We've we've seen the health system renamed to two fat whores or something, whatever it is. You know, I don't know what it is, but it it hasn't made things better. You know, these Oranga Tamariki is so bad that even the Maori Party says that even though it's been Maorified and and that they're looking at this, it's actually a construct of colonialism, and we need to um, you know have permission from Farnau, Iwi, Hapu, etc. They've just got no recognition that actually they're the problem, not yeah. the organisations. Yeah. People you know? who are educated show up for appointments, and that makes all the difference. I'm always anxious, you know, when we're talking about this, you know, not to come across as being anti maori because it just backs them into a corner. I feel like, you know, the end of Dances with Wolves, you know, I feel like that Indian on the ridge who's shouting at uh, John Wyndon Dunbar is, saying... Wyndon is here. Yeah, Wyndon is, Wyndon is here. <laughs> you know, D Dances with Wolves, do you see that I'm your friend? Do you yeah. see that I will always be your friend? You know, I'm, I'm, I feel like that to them. It's like, bros, you're getting played. You know, yeah. I'm not your enemy here. I think they know that, though, Marty. Uh, I don't know, man. It's a, I feel like there's just too many cheap shots toward Pākehā. Um, you and know, they can do it because there's no no one's even going to say, "Oh, you're racist." No, that's right. It's it's a. I mean, the racist card is always effective to use as an argument, although it's becoming more and more meaningless. No, it's wearing off now. I would suggest. Well, as, as I said in that column, you know, it's not racism that uh, is driving the objections of, of white folks in New Zealand to all this stuff. It's that we're a people with a proud history of abolishing slavery and deposing tyrants, and Māori leaders like to talk to park our taxpayers like they're slaves. Yeah. Well, What's is there any hope of getting us back on track? Oh, don't say it. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> the old fight first. We've got a long way to go. A very who's long got way to the go. best? Who's got the best slogan so far? Oh, it has to be Winston. What's this one again? Oh, take yeah. back the country or something. We're going to take back our country. Taking back our country. What's Labour's one? In it for us or something? Yeah, in it, in it for them. Oh, in no, it for something them. just in it. Yeah, you can rearrange yeah. that and make it finito. Um, <laughs> surely they must have realised that that was going to be memed, reamed, memed, like crazy. I don't think they care. They don't care. They didn't anymore. even. They didn't even come up with it. It was. It was a party in Canada two elections ago that had that as their slogan. Oh. It didn't work for them, so it's not going to work for the idiots in, in charge now. Speaking of Canada, Trudeau's have broken up. Well, He'll be transgender within a month. Yeah. <laughs> calling it now. He, he probably um, wanted to Justine. have an operation and his wife wasn't too yeah. it's the taken right thing with the do. idea. She's, 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 noble she's thing clearly got more class than him. All right. Okay, well, I think we're there um, at um, at the end of our political panel for this Friday. Uh, anything to look out for the next week? Cam, you always seem to know what's coming up. Uh, yeah, I think we're going to see a report that comes out about the Maori Health uh, Authority uh, written by uh, an Ernst and Young uh, guy. I'm hearing talk that it is damning, uh, basically saying that the people that have been put in charge of running the Maori Health Authority uh, really shouldn't even be in charge of a fried bread stand at the local um, a you know, and show, um, and they're certainly not fit for office. And so it'll be interesting to see how the media are going to handle that. 
Okay. Mm. Yeah. Any final comments before we press the stop button? No, oh. sir. No, that that covers it off. Love your show, Cam. We've been enjoying that. Yeah, good, yeah, good one. Uh, oh, yeah. We're enjoying doing it. It's fantastic. And yep, uh, yeah. hopefully uh, we can get the National Party and the ACT Party to break their embargo. But I'll just keep asking, and if they don't come on, well. You know, why, why would they have a problem with that, Cam? Well, I don't know because, you know, I've had all sorts on, on the show um, from different parties. Um, you know, I'm not combative. I, I actually have embraced the reality check radio mantra of letting the guests talk. <laughs> and um, it, it is revealing, you know, and uh, they, they, politicians are inoculated with gramophone needles and they can't help to talk. And so if the host, you know, like yourself, Paul, and I've taken a, a, a lead from you, um, and Peter Williams are the same. If we actually let these guys talk, we get to find out just who they are. That's not, you know, just sound bites or, you know, uh, war gamed and manufactured to hell. Um, by public relations consultants. Once they start talking, you give them an hour of time to talk, they generally cut their own throats. Yeah, that yeah. is not in their interest. We're at the first they ignore you part of the cycle, eh? And then yeah. they'll laugh at you, mock you. And then we win. Then they, they realise that the numbers you, are there. Then you win, yeah. Well, that's the thing, you know. And like this is David Seymour's problem. He showed us that his willingness to talk to people by refusing to talk to the protesters at Wellington. He he goes on that he just because he met Glenn Ed, Inwood, you know, a lobbyist for the whaling interests in the backbencher pub, that he met leaders of the protest. We know, we all know that that's not the case. It never happened. Um, and, and, you know, he's, you know, deriding people at meetings. Um, I've got an email today that came in where somebody said, I'm an ACT supporter, but why wouldn't you talk to the protesters? He says, why don't you just sit down? You're boring. Shut up and told an ACT supporter at a public meeting to go away. Mm, and, that's and, now we've, and now we've seen with his Winston Peters thing coming out, he's saying, I'm not interested in talking to the 150,000 or so people that are supporting New Zealand First. So he's just showing again his unwillingness to to debate, to discuss, to talk across the lines. And that's what voters want. That's why we brought in MMP, because they want to see people working together. They don't want to see people like David Seymour saying, no, I'm ruling that person out. You know, mm -hmm. it's arrogant, it's out of touch, and it shows David, shows us as listeners, as observers of the political animal that's there that David Seymour's not interested in listening to to our people. Oh, and, and do you think undercurrent went anywhere? Undercurrent. Unhinged undercurrent? No, I think, it, RNZ I, that, I think the undertow took it out. You think people have forgotten about it? Forgot, it just didn't about. make a splash, did it? No. Well, they, they had high hopes. Ah, uh, well, you know, it's Radio New Zealand. Red Radio. <coughs> you should know. You should yeah. know. Boy, do I do I know. I, th I, th I think for every family out there, um, within the family and the wider family of relatives and family friends and things, every single person has been touched by um, what happened in the last three years. Um, they know that uh, people were in their families were treated appallingly or they've had vax injuries or somebody's yeah. died. Um, and I think that, you know, all that stuff is just going to be shown. And one of the things that worries, must be a worry for people like Seymour, um, is Winston Peters wanting to do a full COVID inquiry if he gets into government. It's an interesting thing you raised there, Olivia. I had drinks here in my apartment um, last Friday and there's an older lady came up from downstairs um, and she sat there and somehow the talk got round to COVID and the whole thing. She said, you know what? She says, I'm just, I'm ashamed that I bought into all of that. And I'm ashamed that I was terribly rude to my friends and my family. Wow. And I'm ashamed that um, that I didn't stand up and say, no, this is wrong. We shouldn't be doing this. And I thought, Shit, you know, she here's somebody who is at, of an age for those people who do what they're told, right? And she's now come to the realisation, here we are three years later, she's come to the realisation that what was done to New Zealand society by the Ardern regime, by the tyrant herself, has left an appalling scar on society. I had an email to yeah. the show, which I didn't read out. The person said, 
They left their name, the email address, so it wasn't anonymous, that have five members of their family are dead. Well, New Zealand's excess Think deaths about up that. 25%. Yeah. Uh, you know, people are dying. Yeah. Five members that's of OECD the family. That's OECD data. Yeah, that's, that's horrific, Paul. But I think that um, this is the thing, is that knowing what happened, Seymour was in Parliament throughout that entire thing, and we know how absolutely authoritarian he was. Um, it has made him even more arrogant. He's always been arrogant, but it's made him arrogant and cruel. Well, and and so long as they keep speaking in that tone to, to the Kiwis or like like what Cam was saying, where he's that rude to people who actually support him when they come into one of his meetings, it's very unattractive. And the average Kiwi finds that repulsive. So, and he hasn't learned anything. Well, when he's talking about happened. the uh, productivity report, he's, he's saying, you know, if we don't have a, a, a good economy, we can't have pharmaceutical drugs you know it's the yeah. first thing on his list and you think well is that linked to your refusal to talk to people about these uh, terrible injuries and deaths yeah uh, look i mean he his campaign has always been funded by epsom doctors <laughs> you know they, all, right. could, all that stuff Pfizer okay so helps. i want to thank uh, i want to thank olivia pearson thank you olivia good to see you again marty yeah, gibson you too, Paul. and cam slater and yeah great job with the show thank you Paul. Say. And uh, let's do it all again next Friday. Let's. Have a great week. See ya. RCR with Paul Brennan. Reality Check Radio.